Welcome to this morning's opening plenary session. Uh, this is our out and accomplished panel. And uh, it is my distinct honor to uh, kick things off and to introduce our moderator. Uh, the Honorable Dot Harris is the director of the Department of Energy's Office of Economic Impact and Diversity. Um, she leads the Department of Energy's efforts to ensure minorities and historically underrepresented communities are afforded the opportunity to participate fully in the department's energy programs. Ms. Harris oversees a corporate funding strategy for minority institutions, develops the current and future department workforce, and works closely to develop small business contract opportunities at the department, and protect the civil rights of departmental employees. I would like to uh, turn the microphone over to um, Dot and let her uh, speak with you before she introduces the panel. Thank you, Chris. Chris is actually one of our amazing fellow scientists at our Savannah River uh, Laboratories in South Carolina. So thank you so much. On the behalf of the amazing group that are being um, supported here today, let me let me start with a. Um, a saying that I share quite often when I speak. And, and what it is, it says, whatever is your life's work, do it well. A man or woman should do his or her job so well that the living, the dead, nor the unborn can do it any better. That's one saying by Dr. Martin Luther King, and it's one that talks about excellence. So it's a matter of excellence, making it that your brand is what this whole conference is about, as you talk about your individuality as well. And I also want to talk about uh, Apple CEO, Mr. Tim Cook stated, my sexuality is one of the greatest gifts God's have given me. He recently stated that with him being the highest profile business CEO to come out. And that says a lot for, for corporate leadership and an amazing gentleman like Mr. Cook. So without further ado, I would first would like to say on the behalf of President Barack Obama, and the Secretary of Energy, Dr. Ernest Moniz, we, I bring you greetings from Washington, D.C. The Department of Energy is an uh, interesting agency. We have over 115,000 employees. Um, over 100,000 of those are actually uh, from the private sector, what we call contractors that support our laboratories. We have 17 national labs around the country, which I think is probably one of the best kept secrets. I think they're uh, some of our national treasures, these particular laboratories. Department of Energy, uh, unlike most agencies, I, I always tease that uh, NASA has a cup full of scientists. The Department of Energy has a boatload of them. Uh, we have um, three of the world's largest supercomputers, for example. Uh, we have the world's largest laser. We are the largest contributor financially to basic science in the world. Uh, we've actually developed probably six or seven of, if you're familiar with, I'm sure, with, the, with this group, with the periodic table. We, the Department of Energy has developed over six or seven elements on the periodic table. One, for example, uh, element 116, Livermorium, um, is one of those that we've developed. So our technology is one that we've developed that um, anywhere from present technology to technology 15, 20 years out. So we do everything, not only in the energy sector we support, but we support the medical um, industry, food and beverage, uh, automotive industry, um, all types of industries, if you could think of it, that require supercomputing, for example. So I think that the Department of Energy, as well as I, I want to do a little um, selfish um, reach out for all of you here in STEM, we are always looking for amazing scientists and engineers um, that if you consider sometime, if you were to consider with the federal government, we'd love to have you think of Department of Energy. Um, so wanted to get that, that request out. So with that, we are here this morning for an amazing panel. And first, let me introduce the, uh, the panelists, and then we will um, uh, just go deep into some uh, amazing dialogue. Um, we are privileged to have this panel, this lineup of panelists that we have this morning. And out and accomplished, that indeed they are. So it is my pleasure to be here um, to moderate this amazing panel. Um, I'm home, actually. I live in Atlanta. My family is here. 
Uh, so I've gotten to sleep in my bed the past few days. So I'm, I'm quite happy. So I'm quite rested and happy this morning. Um, so, so with that, let's start with um, our amazing panelists. First, we have Ms. Lynn Conroy. Uh, Lynn, uh, as you see on my far right, uh, is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science emeritus at the University of Michigan. Lynn made foundational contributions to computer architect at IBM during the 1960s. Sadly, IBM fired her in 1968 when they learned she was transitioning. Quietly coming out in 1999, Lynn went on to create a widely read trans um, advocacy website which has given hope and encouragement to transgender people all around the world. Lynn is a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers IEEE, a fellow of the Computer History Museum, and holds two honorary doctorates, and it is a member, of, and also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Please welcome Ms. Lynn Conway. Next, we have Mr. Terry Demby. He provides flight testing, instrumentation, and data processing, and radio operations and frequency management support services as a test manager for Lockheed. He also served as propulsion flight test lead and lead airframe and aeronautics test analyst for the C-130J flight testing program at Lockheed Martin here in Marietta, Georgia. He began his professional career as a project engineer supporting a variety of engine test programs at the Naval Air Propulsion Center in Trenton, New Jersey. He is a lifetime member of the Society of Flight Test Engineers. So please welcome Mr. Terry Demby. <laughs> Next we have Mr. Jason Grinfell Gardner. Jason is President and CEO of IGI Laboratories. It's on the New York Stock Exchange as IG, a specialty generic pharmaceutical company. Jason has held a number of senior leadership roles in the generic pharmaceutical industry, including operations, corporate and business development, sales and marketing, and strategy. He also served as the president of the American Chamber of Commerce um, in Estonia. Jason is married to his husband, Johan Raku, uh, and he, is, uh, he lives actually in two cities, in Colts Neck, New Jersey, as well as New York City, and they have two amazing basset hounds. Please raise, <laughs> welcome Jason. Thank you. <laughs> and lastly but not least, we have Ms. Donna Raleigh. Donna is a program director for engineering education at the National Science Foundation on rotation from Virginia Tech, where she is a professor of engineering education. Donna is an out bisexual for more than 20 years. Riley has mostly recently been involved in the LGBTQ+, and allowances uh, affinity group at the National Science Foundation, and the outside of work as a blogger for the LGBTQ+, people of faith organization. She has written about LGBTQ plus issues in engineering. Please welcome Ms. Donna Rowley. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Being out in the workplace is a complex personal decision. Research shows two primary reasons for not disclosing LGBT identity a preference to keep personal and professional identities separate, and the fear of potential repercussions. And that's, I'm sure quite a few have, are quite familiar with that, that, that scenario. So can you share with us a little about your journey and why you feel this is important? We'll start with you, Lynn. Well, in my case, um, I spent many decades in stealth after being fired from IBM and restarting my career, and so, most of my experience was coming up through the system, sharing with uh, many women back in those days just the challenges that women faced getting into engineering. So I went through all that, kind of keeping my past uh, on the side. But late in, in, in my career, 
a lot of the early work I'd done started to be talked about. It turned out to have some influence. And, and so I realized that people were tracking down where that came from. So I kind of quietly came out on the internet among my colleagues just kind of talking about that early work. And over a period of time, uh, gradually um, became more out, did some advocacy work. But, um, but actually it wasn't until just a couple of years ago that I really realized that I was still kind of covering and I was hesitating, kind of a recovering shy person, right. you know, and, um, and, uh, and only in the last few years I've kind of got my voice. So, so I think there's a story in that about um, how we're all a product of our times. And, and, um, and we all have to find our own way and our own time to uncover and free ourselves. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Terry? I want to date myself and a little bit of this. So be careful, young people. Um, I never really came out in the classic sense. Uh, when I first started working, um, Jimmy Carter was still the President of the United States. And following his defeat in 1980, Ronald Reagan took over, and then the AIDS crisis hit. And it was a very scary time back in those days. Um, if, you, if you were HIV infected, you could have lost your job, you, got, if you, could, you can get health benefits, and though I was never stricken with the illness, many of my friends were, and I lost a lot of friends, but there was always a, you gotta keep this cool. I got a good job, I was working for the government on my first job with the United States Navy. I then uh, joined, uh, what was that at the time, Grumman Aircraft uh, as a flight test propulsion engineer. And you just, you went with the flow in those days. Uh, you, you did your job, you did your best, though I had to assume that lots of people knew uh, that I was gay. I never talked about a, a girlfriend, though I kept all the guys' wives happy at the Christmas parties because they didn't like to dance and I did. Uh, <laughs> so it was one of those, okay, you keep them happy, we'll, we'll shove and not ask any questions. Um, when I moved to Texas, which was a cultural shock in and of itself, um, <clears throat> Uh, I was working on the F-16 program. Uh, we were doing a, a very large engine update for what we call the Block 50 Improvement Program. Um, again, you show up, here's an African-American man taking on a very large responsibility as a lead engineer in the state of Texas in what was then General Dynamics. And again, it was a, you know, you got the burden of, you know, being an African-American and, and a technical professional um, where everybody's looking at you, and one false mistake, and it's not just you taking a hit, all African males and all African American people in the profession take the, take the mistake. So again, you're playing it cool, you're going with the flow, but again, you kind of knew that people thought they knew, because you heard all the whispers in the background, um, but you know, you didn't say anything. I had a security clearance right now, a top secret clearance with the DOD, you have your program accesses, and you were still the fear that you could lose all this if you said the wrong thing to the wrong person. Went to Georgia, lovely time here in Marietta, Georgia, on the C-130J program. All kinds of people from all across the country. We all had a great time. I knew people's wives and our kids by name, and yet there was still a don't ask, don't tell before there was ever a don't ask, don't tell. When I went to California, I was working on the F-22 program for a couple of years, and I became the test manager in the, in the Palmdale where the Skunk Works is located. And everything was okay for a while. And then I took the interesting step of um, competing in a leather contest. And won. <laughs> and then it went, Really interesting, real fast. Um, I was not really that familiar with some of the social media taking place at the time. I actually, I won the local contest and went on to win first runner up in the LA contest. And I got a call from Fort Worth, that was the headquarters for aeronautics. And a friend of mine saying, what did you do out there? <laughs> 
everyone's looking at your pictures. And if you're, if you're made with a leather community, we take interesting pictures. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? They're Googling you. I'm like, Googling? What are you talking about Googling? Well, Google? What are you talking about? <laughs> so I, I finally did this thing. I went, oh my God. And I, and, I, and I had to say, I didn't handle it very well. I, I panicked. I freaked out. Um, I went on to two other contests, um, won another one for the Southern California position. Uh, but things started to get a little weird. You know, I was hearing things. I really wasn't getting off my boss anymore. Um, and it was just a bad, it was starting to be a really bad time. And so one year, I was just really angry. And I said, you know, I can, I can go on like this, or I can you know, just say something, get off my chest, and move on with my life. And we had a survey, a, a company survey, a, company, a nationwide survey, and I, and I responded to it. And I said, you know, this, this, this nonsense we do against LGBT people in the workplace is it, it, just BS. We got people out there who are living with each other. These are straight people living with each other. They're divorced, remarried, uh, under the old biblical expression of adultery, but they're going to pin on us that we're not worthy, that we're sinful people, and they're going to treat us differently, even though they treat themselves in a much better light. And I said, for 100,000 people in a large corporation as we have, a Lockheed Martin, you can't run a corporation with a thousand value systems. You only run it with one. And if this company is standing up and saying that everybody's valued, then we get to talk the talk and walk the walk. That year, the president of our aeronautics group went on a nationwide aerovision and told us it was okay to be who you were. First time that anybody in Lockheed or anything like that at that level. And at that point I said, okay, if this guy's got the, got the guts as a straight man running this, co this company to, to put us out there on the line and say, I'm with you, I can't just hide anymore. And it was not long after that um, that we established the first pride organization at Palmdale. I was the first president. And I'm very proud that we did that because it showed folks that we were there, we were in high technology, we were excelling at our jobs, and they could not hold that against us any longer. Now, some people still do. Some people still don't want to get it. But they can't ignore us anymore. So I didn't run around with a rainbow flag behind my back saying, hey, I'm here, but I'm here. And that's all that counts. Wow, Tara. Um, sounds like you fell out. Um, <laughs> I f fell over. <laughs> You know, for me, what's fascinating is, you know, I've made a lot of, of career transitions and moved um, in a lot of different places. And each one of those uh, career transitions, um, you get faced with that question over again. You kind of have to come out once more, once more to a new group of people, once more to, and every time you're faced with that sort of a little bit of dread, <laughs> and oh, oh, here we go again. And um, so I'll tell you a bit of that story. Um, after university, and I was out in university, I went to university in Scotland, um, although I'm, I'm originally from the US. Um, and I moved from, a, from Scotland to Estonia in uh, the Baltic States, um, former Soviet country. Uh, not terribly progressive at the time, perhaps in a human rights perspective, but on the right trajectory. Uh, and it was actually a wonderful experience because I met my husband, Johan, who is French, in Estonian lessons. Um, and Estonian is our secret language of love. You didn't know that that could be possible for a swamp language of a million people, but <laughs> it is. Um, and then we moved from Estonia to Poland, and anyone who's in sort of a relationship with, um, you know, a binational relationship, you know that that starts to get really complex as you cross borders and you start trying to move. Um, but actually moving to a very Catholic country like Poland, it was relatively easy, and Johan was technically registered as my concubine if my Polish translation was correct. <laughs> Not sure. 
Um, but he had a card. Uh, it, funky ball? it did. Um, and so then we moved from Poland to, uh, to Singapore, because so I went to do my MBA. And um, I think even before I started that, and I had a little bit more hair then, but not much, I, I went bleach blonde. Um, and I don't, I think, you know, that kind of sent, maybe that was kind of my easy way of sending a signal, like, hi. Um, but it was a wonderful experience, but we had to leave Singapore because like, we couldn't get a visa for Yon to stay in Singapore. He was happy. He was crossing to Malaysia and going diving, like, you know, for four days and coming back. We moved back to France. It was the whole thing over again. Um, but during that time, I started working for a company in the Middle East. And that was a real dilemma for me because, um, you know, you, you start sort of code switching a little bit. You, you, you're very careful about what you say to whom and how, and it's not that you want to be in the closet, it's not that you want to take back your, your character, your personality, but you also don't want to proactively be aggressive towards people and put them in uncomfortable situations. So you kind of walk a line, at least I did. Um, and when I chose to start working for that company full time, I sat down with uh, one of the senior leaders, the vice chairman, and I said, listen, <laughs> we gotta talk. Um, so this is my husband, Jan. He's like, yeah, whatever, we're in business. Let's move on, come on, we got stuff to do. I'm like, cool. And I worked for them for eight and a half years. And they actually moved me back to the US. And that's when life got really complicated um, because in 2008, when we moved back to the US, it wasn't possible for me to get a green card or a visa for my husband. So I was commuting between London and the US. The dog and Yon were in London. I was in New Jersey and New York, and it was, it was messy. Um, and that company actually created a job for my husband and sponsored my husband for his H-1B visa and moved him here. Um, and that was the sort of level of support. And sort of like Harry says, when you get that kind of support in an organization, you know that you're working at the right place. Uh, and so when I made the change now to the role that I have uh, running IGI, it was really difficult for me because we still hadn't had DOMA overturned. My husband was still here on an H-1B visa. These people had been really good to me. And I went in for that interview with a board of directors and with you know, shareholders and people who are you know, really concerned about their returns and how the market thinks about them. And one of the questions I got from the board was, you know, this job's gonna require a lot of travel. How do you think your wife's gonna feel about that? Yeah. And I went, oh boy. So I looked at him, I said, well, uh, you know, to be fair, I, I've got a husband, his name's Johan, I'm sure he'll be fine. And they were like, okay, yep, let's move on. Uh, but it's that, it's that thing that, you know, that there's always that, that that door you gotta open for each one of those things. And what I found for myself is that the more that I'm comfortable in my own place, the more that I'm just who I am, the easier for me it is to, to actually do what I need to get done. And the more authentic that I can be about that with my own team, I mean, we have 100 people at IGI, we're constantly recruiting, and diversity is such an important part of what we do. Um, I owe it to those people as well to, to make it a comfortable place for everybody. Um, and if I, can, if I can do that uh, through that experience, then, then that's something that I, that I really enjoy. So that's been the journey so far. So I came out in the early 90s, and this was an era where politically, first of all, you had ACT UP with these stickers everywhere saying silence equals death. You had a, a queer movement that was all about visibility and all about claiming who we were as a political move because you know there was Melissa Etheridge who kind of everybody knew about. She was hinting about being a lesbian in her songs, but she wasn't out. Ellen, it was before Ellen, right? And so there was there was nobody, and there was a politics around what if we out? What would happen if we outed? all the LGB, there wasn't really, maybe not even be LG <laughs> celebrities at that time, let's be honest. Um, and what would happen if we outed people politically, right? And there, and there came to be this, what about people that are in power? What about people on the Hill, right? What if people knew? Um, and so that was the politics of the time. And being the bacon in the LGBTQ plus sandwich, there's, 
a, an awkwardness about coming out because you can't just drop a relationship into a conversation and say, you know, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my partner, he or she. And because of that, you have to pick a label. You have to say, I am, and then say a word that has the word sex in it, which is very awkward for people to hear. So um, I, at that time, there was, there was Holly Near. Who knows Holly Near, anybody? Yeah, not many people. I didn't think so. So there, <laughs> so there was this woman named Holly Near, who was part of the women's music scene um, in the 70s and 80s. And she had a politics of saying, I'm Holly. So she wouldn't pick a label. And so she was like a role model for me at a point. And I was like, oh, I'll just be Donna. That'll be great. Then I don't have to say anything. And it seemed like I could just have no label. And that lasted about three months. Because what ended up happening for me was um, I grew up Presbyterian. And the Presbyterian Church had this amazing report in 1991 on human sexuality. They had studied the issue, and they wrote this really radical report. It's, it's still, I think, really groundbreaking, because they decided that sexual ethics, that Christian sexual ethics, didn't depend on the form of the relationship. You didn't have to be married to have an ethical relationship. Um, and this was super controversial, and it totally got voted down by the church. But I went to, I was home for the summer from college, and I went, I was at church with my family, and the minister decided to have a special meeting of the congregation to talk about this horrible report and what we were all gonna do about it. And uh, to his credit, he told us all that we should read it, which I did, and it was the most amazing report, and I sort of was able to come out because of that report. And in the meeting, that happened in the church, this guy got up and said, as heterosexuals, we have to you know, oppose this thing, blah, 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 blah. And that's when I was like, that's it, I can't, I can't, I can't just be Donna. Like, I have to have an identity that is not this. And that was what really made me decide that I had to, every chance I had, say that I'm bi and clarify that for people because there's really no subtle way to do that. Um, and so I did that in college before I had career considerations and honestly I, I wasn't thinking about that I wasn't thinking what would happen to me professionally when I did that um, and you know let the chips fall I think um, it's had consequences for sure um, but for the most part I'm a terrible liar so <laughs> I don't think I could have done it any other way diversity is the most amazing thing actually it has been scientifically proven that a more diverse organization is a more productive organization. So I have the pleasure of my job to work with so many different communities of people, whether they're Native Americans or African Americans or Hispanics and Asian Americans. And, and my role at the department is I'm the voice for, I'm the chief diversity officer, I'm head of civil rights and, and EEO for the department. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the one that I'm the highest ranked person of color at the department. So I'm, I'm one of those people that, uh, that a lot of groups come to. The LGBT community, I, I embrace, I support. It's important for us to understand the importance that all of you bring. And I love it. I, I, I look for it. I, I love the, the creative minds and, and, the, and the diversity in, in all who come before me. That's the voice of the President of the United States is quite supportive of the LGBT community. And it's, it's, it's something we have to just let the performance, let your ability be what speaks to all of us first. And when that happens, this country will become a more productive country. This country will then achieve the, the level of economic development and security and all that we need to make these United States of America that leading country again. And we need all talent, all diverse talent, all amazing talent, and all of which you are. So for the next question, what can LGBT individuals can do at their workplace to help their colleagues understand their experiences in the workplace? So what can you do based on what you've done in the workplace to encourage our audience? I'm gonna reverse it and I'm gonna start with Donna first. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about what's going on at NSF, um, which is pretty exciting that, um, thanks to Janice Hicks, who, by the way, sends her regards to everybody. She was sad she couldn't be here. Um, but Janice was someone who had been in NSF for a long time. She was senior executive service, which is 
a, an important and prestigious status within the federal government. So she's someone who had been in the agency a long time and knew a lot of folks. And she really founded the LGBT plus uh, group at NSF. And um, we started meeting socially um, and it was a really important thing just to create that space where people could come and be together and recognize each other. I think that was the most important first step. And we did it at a time, I think because of the Obama administration, I think it was at a time when um, it was relatively safe to do so, that the timing of it. When I think about the CIA doing this in 1983, I don't know how they did that, um, I really don't. But, um, but it was a fairly safe thing to do at NSF when Janice started the group. Um, and there's a, we have a, a distribution list, we have a lot of allies involved, and we have um, just a, an exciting kind of group of folks who like to hang out and do stuff. And the thing that was great was our Office of Diversity and Inclusion has been working with us, even though we're not a, a properly recognized employee group, um, they have a, there's a really prominent um, display case at one of the entrances of NSF where um, whatever the diversity month is, if it's Black History Month, Women's History Month, they dedicate the display to the diversity theme and June was available. So they said, we said, we proposed a pride window. They said, great. And so they were a little afraid. It was really fun to work with them because they were sort of like, what are you going to do? <laughs> Are you going to have go-go boys in there, <laughs> right? <laughs> Out and accomplished, I have to say. Um, so, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. But, um, <laughs> but we, you know, we put some feather boas in there, the rainbow, you know, we had some. And, and we also had a serious point to make um, about some of the federal employees who really did have a difficult time um, as federal in scientists in the 50s. Um, and so we, we had a bit of an LGBT history um, part to it, and we celebrated <coughs> our um, out and accomplished folks that are NSF funded. So we've been doing, including Lynn, um, and we've been sort of doing that as a, um, as a way to sort of create visibility. When the Alan Turing film came out, we hosted an event for that. And that's been what we've been doing so far. And it's, um, in some ways, it's a small thing, right? It's not that hard to have a lunch every month where people can come and talk to each other, but it really does make all the difference because you create community, um, and then that creates the space to plot and scheme some other things. As an organization, uh, you know, my job is to create a safe environment that is welcoming to everyone to work. And that means setting some standards and that means having some principles and talking about them and setting expectations for people about what is acceptable and what is not in terms of treatment of others in the workplace. You know, if you walk around our facilities, you'll see a series of posters that might seem a bit glib, but they all say work hard and be nice to people. And that's the fundamental principle of you know, how we run our organization. And as you change that culture, as you change a culture of something that's been sort of a, an older manufacturing-based culture into something that's more science-based, um, and as you try to drive that diversity, you do a lot of education, right? And you do a lot of sensitization. You try to bring people along with you. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, we had uh, just a sort of corporate training program to start talking about people um, in diversity in the workplace. And some of the responses were what you would expect. There is that sort of almost immune response that happens as people get confronted with something that's a little bit uncomfortable. I mean, this is a, you know, our primary facility is located in what I like to refer to as super south New Jersey. I, I didn't know New Jersey was this long. My own state. Uh, listen, I, it's, it's a long way. I commute 200 miles a day. Um, and you know, part of that, that process was talking about uh, uh, the LGBT community, but in particularly uh, the transgender community and what that meant uh, for the workplace. And you know, this is 100 people working in a manufacturing site. Um, that was not something that they had ever thought about or you know, really engaged with. Um, and 
even if that was an uncomfortable process for the organization, it was a helpful one. And so, as I say, you know, part of that job is starting to take people uh, along that, that journey. The second part of this for me is that uh, I think that as you think about diversity and particularly in, in STEM and you think about it in pharmaceuticals, there aren't a lot of great on-ramps for people into this um, part of industry that um, draws in diversity. It's a part of, if you think about where people go to do recruitment for pharmaceuticals, for scientists, for analytical chemists, for all of these things, it's a very non-diverse group of people. It's a very uh, white, straight male environment. And trying to kind of drive that means you have to take your human resource assets and say, all right, we gotta proactively go find the people we want um, to drive a broader organization because it's enough to just kind of talk about diversity and you know have that part of the website, but it's something else to go take your corporate assets and go find those team members you need to drive the d diversity agenda. Um, if you believe that that's what drives value for an organization, and we do. So that's what we're trying to do. What I found is, in the, if you're gonna be a STEM professional, the be, the, actually the best thing you can do is simply be the best STEM professional you can be and excel at what you do. Your technical chops are much more valuable than you know. If you're known for being that, the, the best biologist in the lab, or the best engineer on the project, you establish a, a credibility that they cannot take away from you, no matter what they think of you. Um, I, uh, just about a week or so ago, one of my, my new boss um, said to me, you know, I was talking to so-and-so, and she said, you were the best flight test analyst they ever had on that project. And I'm like, oh, well, well, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate that. And, other people said the same thing, and I'm like, you know, this is, this is good. Um, when I became the pride president, I would never have thought that I would have had my picture taken and had it posted all over the company uh, website. as, you know, this is Terry Denby, and look who he is. Uh, but I didn't have to say anything. Um, and, and, those, and those things build on your technical um, cr credentials. Uh, going to the, to the pride parade. We did a um, at what we call a connect and engage event. You know, we had, we just had a table for the for the organization. I stood behind it. I didn't have to really say anything. I was just I just had to be there as the flight test manager who works with some very interesting individuals, to say the least. If you know anything about test pilots, um, they are, they're a very interesting culture. But you. But when you, when you establish yourself as a true professional, a true technical professional, you can take that and, and leverage that into the social responsibilities and duties of your organization. As an ELCO, I mean, that's what we call us as, as managers, I have a duty and responsibility to take care of my people, the people who, who I employ, within the confines of the rules and regulations of the corporation and to ensure that I help them be the best that they can be. And I've got, I think I got a pretty good reputation about doing that. A lot of people don't ask me lots of questions, but they know that I'm there. My door is open. They see me. And, if they, and they can come to me and ask a question if they have a question or have some inquiries. It's built on being the best technical professional that you can be. And that's something that no one can take away from you. You know, in my own case, uh, and following on your lead, I think uh, maybe uh, one observation I have, like about what I've been doing over the years, um, is just being, a, being an engineer building things, exploring, uh, figuring out what is possible to do. And when you get in a corner, you know, how can you find a way out? When you come to a river, you need to cross, you know, you think about how to do that. What stepping stones can you put out there to get across that river? And um, 
in, in the case of the trans issues and trans, trans emergence during the late 90s and on through the, uh, the 2000s, a lot of that turns out to have been closely coupled with the emergent um, uh, cyberspace uh, communications, collaboration, technology, and so forth. Um, the the numbers, uh, number of trans people around the world um, at the time was thought to be incredibly tiny. You know, the, the psychiatric community typically referred to uh, trans people as being sort of one in 10,000 or one in 30,000 people, that sort of thing. And um, I know one of the, <laughs> right about the time I was coming out uh, to my colleagues about my work, I, I did some back of the envelope calculations, pretty easy, the kind of thing you know an old farmer could do, you show them some land and you, know, you say, okay, um, you know, I'll sell you this for so many, so many dollars an acre, and they say, well, how many acres you got here? And you know, if they grossly underestimate the number, uh, you, you take the deal. You know, if they say it's 20 acres, they have no clue it's really 200. <laughs> Well, you know, you go ahead and seize that territory. Um, and that was the thing. I, I was able to pretty easily, based on numbers I knew from Dr. Benjamin's work back in the 60s, knowing the actual number of people that were fully transitioning right then per year. I mean, he had, to, he had numbers. He was, he was internet central and knew, he was the one that was routing everybody to the handful of surgeons around the world. And, and so I would look at his numbers and, and sort of current numbers I thought, you know, I think they're off by two orders of magnitude, just as an engineer, okay? Just numbers really count, folks, and, and people in science and technology know that. You make a mistake of two orders of magnitude, and you've really blundered into something big. <laughs> and, and they had no clue that they had done that, because all their research told them that. They only read their own <coughs> research papers, because obviously, if something isn't published in a scientific journal, it's, it's not true, you see? You know, we all know about the problem with scientific journals. So knowing that, and then having the trans community come under attack by the psychiatric community during the 2000s especially, as they were ramping up to get transsexualism, transgenderism permanently encoded in the DSM-5 as a uh, pretty serious mental illness, a lot of us got together knowing that we're two orders of magnitude more of us than they realized, we started <laughs> You know, kind of reaching out, finding each other, and mounting a frontal assault against the uh, psychiatric community. Now, the one thing about this, uh, we're leaving tracks. Everyone's leaving tracks. And, 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 you know, you speak of Google and finding out what you're doing. Well, now, you know, first thing you do, you need some money, look at their Google. <laughs> and voila, you know, you find out so much. Who you are is now like in the ether around you as you wander around, and other people will quickly know more than you might be thinking about whether you're someone they'd like to go have a drink with, or someone they'd like to go camping with, or whether you'd be someone that they'd actually be willing to go into combat with. You see, as, as creators of this stuff, we get to shape the ideology of the technologies that are emerging. We, we get to, to, to to channel some of these forces in directions that are more productive, uh, more mutually supportive. Uh, you know, it's so curious that the creators of the Titster app uh, weren't aware, I mean, how could they not be aware that people would notice and that forever their lives would carry forward what they had done, the, and, and clueless to the meanness of it, and yet a powerful, vibrant civilization uh, it always finds ways to have cross currents of all different sorts of folks wandering through and being accepted, uh, being engaged, and people can tell that, okay, you're from this clan, and, and so when we talk to you, we, we may act a little differently because we want to be able to communicate with you. We want to be able to have you on our team and vice versa. So I think, I think the experience, especially the experience of the trans community has been really interesting because since the emergence has been largely modulated by the technology of the emerging social age, we sort of found ourselves out there at the point of the spear, uh, uh, just kind of doing stuff in order to survive, in order to uh, 
want, you know, attack ambushes, for example. That's a great tactic, by the way. So the psychiatric community never really recovered, actually, from the, the assault they were making on the trans community. The science and engineering and mathematics community, along with the artistic, creative communities, um, can, we can all empower ourselves to really create the kind of future that we'd all like to live in. And we can have a lot of fun doing that. And, and so beyond just the corporations we work for and the kind of jobs we're gonna have, to the extent that we all stay connected with that, um, as a community, we'll see all kinds of openings for things we can do to further uh, diversity and inclusion. Awesome. Thank you. All right, now what we could do now is open in the audience up for a few questions. Hi Donna, I'm also a queer person of faith and I was just wondering about your experiences as a person of faith within the scientific community as well as as a queer person because I know that the scientific community also um, sometimes um, can be discriminatory towards people of faith and it works in both directions. So I just wanted to hear about your experiences. I mean, I think that's exactly right. I think there's definitely a firewall expected and for the most part I've respected that firewall. Um, I'm, the faith tradition I come from doesn't have opposition to science really, it's really compatible so and so therefore I don't have some of the conflicts that some people might have, I don't know what I'm saying about that but um, I'm not really that, I mean, I'm out in the sense that if you Google what I do, you find out, I've, you know, I was involved in the queer movement in the Presbyterian Church for a long time. <laughs> but there's two yellow jackets that I'm thinking about right now that were on the, pres the queer Presbyterian board that um, an electrical engineer who's a trans woman who graduated in 1964, who went to her reunion at Georgia Tech as a woman when there were no women that graduated in 1964 in electrical engineering from Georgia Tech. Right? So she's awesome. Um, so I'm thinking about her. She still lives in Atlanta. She's around. Um, and so there's, there's a ton of scientists kicking around in faith communities, and there is a whole dialogue on on sort of faith and science, and the AAAS has a dialogue called DOSER, um, and then there's also religious communities that have dialogues about science, and it's interesting about who goes to which one, and there's an interesting kind of overlap and lack of overlap in those communities, but I think it hasn't come up so much for me in the workplace. I work on, one of the things I work on is engineering and social justice. When you do that, and you put engineering and social justice together, there's a whole tradition, it's a religious tradition around social justice, and so how one sets that up and how you bring that in is a tricky thing. And I think that um, from that community, what has been difficult in that community is folks that are sort of imposing their religious views on people that are not religious. So there's, in that community, it's an interesting space because there are people coming at it from explicitly faith perspectives. And there's ways in which people do it that's open and there's ways in which people do it that is um, not open to other people's perspectives. And so I think that that's kind of the key about um, about how to do that, but I think it would be much harder to try to do that in, um, in, a, in a mainstream science space to talk about faith background is very difficult. But there are spaces that are dedicated to doing that, like the AAAS space and so on. Do you recommend coming out during an interview to make sure it's a safe place before you actually move to the job? I don't, know, I don't know if you have to come out during the interview, but you can ask the right questions. You can ask about their policies. Ask do they have a non-discriminatory policies? Are they an inclusive workplace? And a straight person can ask those same questions, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a gay-oriented question. You would be asking for your friends. Uh, I know you guys network like, like there's nobody's business. Um, I've certainly uh, come across that with the young people that I've hired. So, you can, you can pose it that way. Find out what they believe. That interview is not just you, they interviewing you, it's you interviewing them. And finding out if they're worthy of your talents as well. So pose those kind of questions. 
uh, uh, do the research on, online before you go into the interview. Find out what their policies are. Uh, but uh, find out. You can find that out and, and make your determination as well. And I guess I believe that I've fallen in love with my um, major and I believe that I've fallen in love with the kind of goals that I have set for myself. But I definitely, from people who've kind of walked walk the walk, um, when was that moment that you just kind of fell head over heels with the stars and planes and chemicals? Um, when, yeah, when was that moment? I'll go first because I didn't do that. <laughs> so, uh, oh sorry for the feedback. Um, so I got into engineering because I was interested in working on environmental problems. That's what drove me. And so, and engineering, no one really told me about engineering's kind of political sensibilities. Um, and it was really disappointing. My father was a chemical engineer and he sort of, I was like, oh, I wanna work on environmental problems. Do I go into poli you know, in like political science? Do I do you know, biology? There wasn't really an environmental science major at most schools yet at that time. And he was sort of like, oh, you should do chemical engineering. It's perfect. And like, no, I shouldn't have. That was really bad advice. I didn't know. And so, so I went and took what was basically an applied math education, where they never put anything in any kind of context in my chemical engineering education. They were, they were really super theoretical where I went. And uh, so I kind of was really, it was difficult for me. And, and I guess maybe the closest thing to the moment you're asking about is that I went outside my department to work with a woman. There were no women, female professors in my department. So I had this opportunity to work with this woman who was in this back wing, so this is Princeton University, and there's, there used to be the Institute for Defense Analysis back when there were all of these sort of DOD research centers on uh, campuses. So it had, it was, it was amazing. They had converted it into the Center for Energy and Environmental Studies, and they had this bulletproof glass that was like super thick, and there was this creepy vault in there and stuff. But anyway, so I went back there, and there was this research scientist who was doing work on industrial ecology, and I was like, oh my god, I get to work on a, with a woman on environmental problems. That's amazing. And I went back to my advisor to try to get approval to do this independent study with her. And they said, does she have a PhD? And I didn't really know. I'm sort of, I didn't, you know, my father was first in his family to go to college. He never really let me know anything about academia and the politics of that. And I really didn't know what I was saying when I said back, oh yeah, she has a PhD from Cornell in high energy physics. And they were like, oh. <laughs> okay, you can work with her. <laughs> so there was this whole negotiation that was happening that I wasn't even aware of. But I got to work on this project with her, and she was an amazing mentor. She's, I am, I'm in engineering education now, and so I've always been this kind of crosser of disciplines. And I went from chemical engineering undergrad to an engineering and public policy PhD, because I thought I still want to work on environmental problems. And in chemical engineering, they said, when I, when I applied to this program, Carnegie Mellon PhD program in, in uh, engineering and public policy, they said, you know you can never be an engineering professor if you, if you go to this program. Mm. And I said, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. I was like totally okay with that, because I'm like, I just wanna work on environmental problems. So then I went to grad school and um, thought I was gonna go at, end up at the EPA. Like that's really what I thought I was gonna do was work in government. Um, and I, I fell in love with teaching while I was there. We had to teach a, a, a sort of problem-based learning class, a community-based learning class on, um, in my case, it was Pittsburgh's urban forest. And um, it was very interdisciplinary, nothing to do with chemical engineering, it was really fun. And um, not because of that, but you know. And, <laughs> and so then I, I got curious about why my education at Princeton had been so, made me feel so much like I didn't know anything. I was so disempowered in those classes. The professor would come in and write these like 30 year old crispy notes that were like yellowed, put that on the board and we wrote what was on the board in our notes and we figured it all out later. We never had a conversation in class. And I was very curious about why my classes outside of engineering weren't like that at all. And even though it, these were areas I wasn't familiar with, I could take five romantic poets and feel like I knew what I was talking about having never read Milton. And meanwhile, in my engineering class, where I'm supposed to have had the prerequisites, I felt like I didn't know anything and the professor knew everything. So I got curious about that in grad school. Um, didn't really do much with that, but then when Smith College hired me to be uh, an engineering professor there, 
I noticed that my students were suffering the same fate that I was in undergrad, and I wanted to disrupt that. So I asked a sociologist friend about what that was about. She said, you have to read Bell Hooks's book, Teaching to Transgress. I read that book, changed totally everything I was doing in the classroom. That led to me writing a career proposal for engineering education at NSF, and then my career totally changed. And I think the long story short of this is that there's no career planning, <laughs> in my, at least in my history, right? I couldn't have set out and said, oh, I'm gonna be a professor at the first women's engineering program in the United States, because it didn't exist, right? And so there was no, there was no preparing for that. And I just did what I was interested in, what I loved. And it's not that I, I don't have this experience of like, oh, I always loved X thing. It changes, it's fluid. So uh, I was, this cultural reference may not translate across the ages, but I was going to grow up to be Alex P. Keaton from <laughs> Family Ties. Um, it's totally my goal, like from the beginning. I was going to be an investment banker, it was gonna be awesome. I would have ties from Brooks Brothers. Um, and I went to university and got my degree, my master's degree in economics. Um, I, it was a Scottish education, so it involved doing, you know, ordinary least squares regression by hand, uh, because that's somehow character building. Um, <laughs> and uh, I spent seven and a half years doing investment banking in Central and Eastern Europe, and it was a lot of fun. And um, you know, when you end up, you know, doing due diligence on pig farms that are six stories tall, um, you realize that it's not quite as glamorous, perhaps, as all of that. Um, and so when did this change? I think for me, where I became really a pharma geek, I started getting exposure to pharmaceuticals there, but where I became a pharma geek and where I became really passionate about it is that this is kind of an intersection of two things for me. It's um, one, the complexity of what we're able to create and the fun behind that and the team behind that. Even if a lot of what we're doing is um, generic specialty stuff, that's um, injectable products and topical products and things like that. Um, it's, it's still an interesting problem to solve. Um, but where it took meaning for me uh, was when I would spend time going around and visiting hospital pharmacies and hospital pharmacy buyers around the country. And I got to know a lot of these people very well, and I still do. And there's a huge drug shortage in this country. Um, today there are 69 injectable critical acute care products that are in drug shortage. Um, you know, a couple of years ago the country had less than seven days worth of ciprofloxacin um, tablets in inventory in the entire country. We, we run a very fragile supply chain because it's a regulated industry and because it relies on uh, you know, the nature of the active pharmaceutical ingredients and the, and the plants and, and physical infrastructure that make it. And so I would start getting phone calls from people like the pharmacy director of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia or from the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles who would say, we can't treat our pediatric leukemia patients because one, we can't get the cytotoxic product and so you've got to solve that problem. And then for a completely stupid problem. 0.8% um, sodium bicarbonate in solution is not an approved drug product. And because of the change in government regulation, you can't make it um, the way you used to make it. So nobody can solve that problem without going through a five-year regulatory process and spending about $5 million to get it done. And yet you need that as you buffer certain treatments, um, particularly for pediatric patients. And it's like, this is craziness. But as you confront, the, and that's just one example, as you confront those individual issues and you see the impact that that has on, on people's lives, that's what, that's what gets me up in the morning. Uh, that's why I spend all weekend you know, reading data about uh, pharmaceutical supply and demand and shortage and what's moving and what's not. Um, so that's why I'm a pharma geek. I remember, still, being in kindergarten, and they all shepherded us into a room, and we're watching a little black and white television screen to watch the first suborbital launch of Alan Shepard on the Redstone rocket. And it was, I mean, back in those days, space flight was not very precise. 
and they aborted several times, and they used to shepherd us every day to wait for this thing to launch. Um, and it was just one of those really cool things to look at. I grew up on a farm. My, my father was a hired hand on a dairy farm. And I always thought, well, I might become a farmer, which is really hard work if you know anything about farming. It's dangerous work. Uh, but it was cool too because you know, the tractors and the balers and, and, and even the cow manure spreaders was an interesting thing to watch, how it worked and stuck all the stuff out the back end. Um, I also had an interest in, in the oceans. I, uh, I had this thing about, I, and I was not a swimmer, I didn't know what, where the connection came from. Um, I asked what thought about going to oceanography, but you know, uh, time went on. I, I was watching this country went from flying airplanes at just under uh, Mach 1. I watched it go to Mach 3 with the YF-12 and the SR-71 and the XB-70 programs back in the 60s. Um, we were going to the moon. I was watching the, the Gemini shots and, and you know, um, the, the uh, time that they had, did a rendezvous with the Agena uh, target and it spun out of control and, they, and they, they stopped all the broadcasting to show this emergency in space. We thought we were gonna have a first catastrophe in space that time. Um, everyone was glued to this stuff. Uh, I remember having my Apollo lunar module model on the floor in the living room in July of 1969, we landed on the moon. Um, but the real thing I think that took me over was, I was about 16 years old, and a friend of mine had a, a brother-in-law, and he took me and my friend and another friend up in a Cessna, and we were flying around southern New Jersey one afternoon. And you know, you're sitting up at 5,000, 7,000 feet, and you're looking down on the planet, and you're just, this is the neatest thing I've ever been. And I got home. I walked in the door, and my mother said, your father said if he had known you were going out this morning to get in an airplane, you would have never gotten out the front door. And then I was hooked. <laughs> and and, and, and I, I, that's a side note. My, my parents, they died, and they never flew. They never got to experience that, 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 that sensation of, of, of being in an airplane. And when I took my first actual jet flight, I was, going to, I was checking out colleges at the time. And I, I mean, I was so excited. I was calling home every time I landed. And hey, I got here alive. It was, it was really a lot of fun. This is, you know, this is really cool. Uh, but by that time, I already decided to go into aerospace engineering. And, it's been that way ever since. I, I think that the achievement of flight is one of man's greatest accomplishments. It's uh, to be a part of that and to have been a part of all the stuff that I saw when I was a kid to what we're doing now, what we're going to go do. We're going to go to Mars. We're, we're, we're going to go to the, we're going, we've gone out beyond the, the solar system with Voyager. It, it, this is, it's an amazing science. It's just an amazing engineering feat. And I just love it to death. I just don't know how else to say it. You know, I can't help but think, uh, as, as we share our stories, you can see this connectivity across the stories. It's really amazing. My father was a, a research engineer, a chemical research engineer. And he ended up, during World War II, uh, being the chief engineer of the, of the US's synthetic rubber program. I remember as a very young child going out to a flight line of B-17s and, and uh, going inside one and having my father show me the rubber that uh, was in the wires and the tires and the de-icing boots and, and in some of the things the pilots were wearing. And, um, and of course those things were gonna go off and they were gonna kill Germans. Um, so you see, that, that's the kind of thing that affects you in life, um, it was a very different time, a very frightening time actually, especially for children. And but my father was a research engineer. My mother, speaking of kindergarten, was a kindergarten teacher. Now think of the combination: <laughs> chemistry sets, and then all kinds of junk that my mother got from all the local lumber yards and all over the place back before there were regulations on what you could take into schools to bring all this stuff into her classroom so kids could make things. 
But I became fascinated with astronomy, and of course that immediately led into um, mathematics and physics. There's something about a process that that I became sensitized to when I was when I was young. And um, anyway, uh, that led along to where I ended up uh, going to MIT and, of course, studying physics. So to make a long story yes. short, <laughs> what I really ended up doing after happening to uh, leave MIT in a, uh, in a sort of period of, of, of extreme angst about my gender situation, I ended up starting back again at Columbia University right when they were getting into computing seriously with support from IBM. I ended up doing an independent study with a person, Herb Shore, who was an adjunct professor from IBM. And I ended up taking a paper and becoming fascinated by, by M.V. Wilkes on how to build a self-compiling compiler in a little simple list processing language. And the idea of a self-compiling compiler, I guess to bring it up to date, it's sort of like the work at Michigan Tech, making a 3D printer that prints 3D printers. <laughs> the idea of taking something and being, using it to, to evolve the next step. And then you just think, okay, there it is, exponentiation. And so at that point, my life went into computing and I've kind of been exponentiating ever since. Awesome, very good, thank you. Well, listen. Folks, I, first of all, thank you for your time and attention this morning. Thank another round of applause for the panelists. <laughs> Let me uh, leave you on one note, um, and it's all about you guys determining your own destiny. But it all begins with your imagination, because your imagination becomes your thoughts. Your thoughts then becomes your actions. Your actions then becomes your habits. Your habits turns into your character. And then whatever your character is becomes your destiny. So it's about the fact that you control your destiny. It is our pleasure and our privilege and our honor to have any of you in any of our institutions or organizations. So you go in and you have your own, I use the term executive presence. So when you walk into the room with your background, your credentials, your education, your experience, that will speak for who you are. That will show who you are first and, for, and foremost before anything else. We all have obstacles that we face in the workplace. And I look to STEM professionals like yourself as just, the, just who you are. You're just amazing. Make excellence your brand as a professional, as a student. And it will speak first. And to me, everything else falls after that. So on that, thank you so very much. Have a good day.